I believe that the wider conspiracy world, or as its advocates somewhat grandiously refer to themselves, the truth movement, is the current counterculture. And on that basis, I believe that there's a lot of deceptive energy going into it from all manner of sources. Before we get started, it seems fitting to have a brief review of the aims and modus operandi of earliest incarnations of the counterculture. The primary goal was, and still is, the destruction of Christianity, certainly any kind of Christianity worthy of the name. This holds precedence over all other motives. Without success in this endeavour, none of their adjacent plans could come to fruition. This is both in terms of practicality around socially engineering a population to be fit for the elite's future plans, and in the more esoteric. Without the destruction of what Crowley described as the Age of Pisces, characterised as a time dominated by organised religion, they cannot usher in the Age of Aquarius, an age marked by pursuit of desire, or will, beyond all else. Knowing that you cannot just remove religion from a society overnight, they provided exotic alternatives in the form of the pagan Hinduism beloved of Aldous Huxley and many of his peers, and the velvet-gloved Luciferianism of the New Age, to act both as a distraction and a balm to the psyches of a societally traumatised population. Here is a definition of what falls under the New Age's, no pun, umbrella. Quote, The New Age is a term that refers to a broad and diverse spiritual and metaphysical movement that emerged in the late 20th century. New Age beliefs encompassed a wide range of ideas, practices and philosophies, often with an emphasis on personal growth, spirituality and holistic well-being. New Age beliefs are eclectic, drawing from a wide range of religious and spiritual traditions, such as Eastern philosophies, indigenous spiritual practices and Western esotericism. End quote. What this definition lacks is what exactly is it the New Age of? The answer, of course, is Crowley's great obsession, the Age of Aquarius. To draw the curtain down on the Age of Pisces, time characterised by organised religion and piety, and usher in the hyper-individualistic, anarchic and self-obsessed Age of Aquarius. Every time you hear of New Age practices, shops or music or whatever else, Bear in mind, this is what it's all about, the age of Aquarius, and its willing participants being baby-stepped towards an engineered, mass-engendered, psycho-spiritual summoning of a society fit to be ruled over by a Crowleyite elite. Returning to the quote on the end of this generic definition of the New Age, it states, There is a willingness to synthesize and adapt beliefs and practices to suit individual needs. End quote. Suit individual needs indeed. Despite its warm and fuzzy appearance, under the bonnet, the New Age is entirely Luciferian. Everything must be subordinate to the individual's needs, as this correlates with Crowley's obsession regarding will or intention. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, being Thelema's ultimate credo. Of course, the vast majority of people caught up in the New Age are oblivious to the true nature of its Luciferian tricksterism. They might attend meditation retreat, practice traditional forms of yoga, do energy work and all points in between in the belief that in doing so they will find some respite from the stresses and strains of modern life. A not unreasonable motivation on the surface, however what they will find is that they will be drawn oblivious and moth-like towards the flame of the light bearer, whom falsely presents himself as an ally to man, as a purveyor of momentary comfort and illusory spiritual growth. Beyond the masses and their oblivious spiritual consumerism, Open advocates of the literal religion of Luciferianism will proclaim that Lucifer re represents wisdom, enlightenment, individualism and the pursuit of personal empowerment. Of course, this is how they frame it. In reality, it is worship of the self, at the expense of all. It is a true embodiment of Crowley's do what thou wilt, fetishization of intention and pursuit of desire beyond all else. If you're wondering what kind of world adherence to this system would create, I'd suggest looking all around you. It's the prevailing dogma of the modern elites, fitting, as it does, like a glove to the mentality of the sociopath. Beyond the elites, we can see how this belief system has been moulded into the fabric of today's wider society. Indeed, what distinction is there with low-key Luciferianism and standard NPC atheism? Only a sense of knowingness and being aware of the societal sleight of hand, I would argue. With the smug midwit sneering contemptuously at what he refers to as the need for a sky daddy, as the mark, clouded by his own self-impressed grandeur, oblivious to his own ensnarement. The open promotion of atheism in recent years is a key stage in the operation's evolution. All those fervent celebrity atheists, were they really just useful idiots, or were they knowing foot soldiers in a Luciferian sting? 
Ultimately, all we can do is speculate. So what began in the 1960s with the establishment's manufacturing of four sardonic mop tops into the most influential youth figures on the planet, before their morphing into psyche-shattering drug advocates, had them then decamping to the foothills of India to return with tales of spiritual enlightenment and exoticism to fill the ears of their wide-eyed previously teen bopper demographic. The first countercultural swing of Tavistock's societal wrecking ball against the vestiges of a traditional European Christian framework, being pagan Hinduism, exotic non-European mysticism, and the promotion of a self-centred literal navel-gazing in place of Christian morality. If we are to look at the boomer demographic as one individual subject, the engineers having filled his head with neurotic and hysterical pop star worship in the early to mid-1960s, then had those stars advocate tacitly and latterly overtly potent mind-altering drugs, manufactured in the laboratories of CIA assets such as Owsley and William Leonard Pickard. The subject is then baby-stepped into willingly undergoing chemically wrought self traumatization known at the time as being turned on, and then, in his broken-down state, he is offered the subliminally Luciferian spiritual band-aid of the New Age of Aquarius. All this just to keep the population away from the way, the truth and the life, and distracted with societally malign frivolity whilst leading them towards a low-key Luciferian belief system. Which is where we return to the truth movement. It would be naive to think that the overarching multi-generational counterculture operation ended in the late 1990s, with the, so with the socially engineered hedonism of Gen Xers shuffling around in wide-eyed abandon somewhere in a field in Hampshire. Instead, it evolves and goes where the action is. In the last decade, I would point to two main fronts. The first, an open 1960s reprise with the early podcast age of the early to mid 2010s. This centered around Joe Rogan and his wider orbit, evangelizing pot, DMT, psychedelics, and an obsession towards self-improvement, a conveyor belt of eccentric characters proclaiming all manner of wild theories and lifestyle choices, yet never once explicitly pushing or even stating a Christian message. As Luciferian as the 1960s, only having a respray and update to fit the more openly self-obsessed times. And now, the self-proclaimed truth movement. I do not wish to dwell on whether certain figures are controlled or not, but I feel we must at least give a cursory glance to the major cultural figure behind this scene, in Britain at least, and the events around his birthing in the role in the public's consciousness. David Icke retired from professional football aged 21 due to arthritis and pursued a career in journalism. He rose through the ranks of local sports journalism to a role on the BBC's flagship Newsnight in 1981. Two years later he was given a role on the BBC's first breakfast show, Breakfast Time. He later worked on Grandstand as a co-host. Towards the end of the 1980s Icke began to become interested in the New Age through energy work with a self-proclaimed psychic healer named Betty Shine. Quote, Shine had spoken with Ike when he went to her for a consultation, where she told him that he was the son of God amongst other claims. It may be possible that in Rosicrucian tradition that Betty Shine is referring to in relation to Ike, the son of God simply means someone who has purified themselves and developed such high levels of self-sacrifice that they have reached a level of consciousness that serves only the greater good and the brotherhood of mankind. End quote. Rosicrucian red flag number one. By his third session, she had told him that she had a message from a Wang Yi Li from the spirit world, aka demons. This message pertained that, quote, I could been sent to heal the earth and would become famous but would face opposition. The spirit world was going to pass ideas to him, which he would speak about to others, end quote. What are these spirit guides that New Ages seem so eager to welcome into their lives? What is the quid pro quo nature of this contact? Are they really so naive to open themselves up to these energies from this so-called spirit realm? It would appear so. Christ battled and cast out demons during his life, the literal son of God rather than some Rosicrucian semantic trick. And yet they think that they can just throw open the doors and windows to them and then bask in what they believe to be these spirits' benign light. The word reckless doesn't seem to do it justice. In 1991, David Icke appeared on the Freemason Terry Wogan's flagship BBC chat show for what would become a grand public unveiling of his new incarnation. He proclaimed himself a son of God, made some claims about future catast catastrophes unfulfilled, and was mocked and derided by both host and audience. And so the modern myth began. 
For the sake of brevity, let's assume his wider career in theorising are broadly well known. Ike is commune with, and at points claiming to be led by, what he calls spirits for over 30 years. Quite frankly, his late 80s spiritual awakening sounds very much like some form of demonic possession. He has spent the following years preaching an explicably anti-Christian message. He regards all organised religion as mental prisons that were conceived by the Babylonian Brotherhood. He advocates meditation, energy work, psychedelic drugs and endless cul-de-sacs of novelty and intrigue, whilst keeping his followers in a New Age holding cell with no Christ as Lord, Saviour and Protector and no cohesive shared religion for society to rally behind. His rationale is to encourage people to go on a voyage of self-discovery, essentially a make-your-own-religion toy set, as Luciferian a concept as one could imagine. So where does this differ to the counterculture 1.0's modus operandi? In place of rock gods, hippie beads and mu music festivals, instead we are now offered streams, tweets, audiobooks and conference hall appearances. But the underlying message remains the same. Stay detached from Christian morality, indulge in New Age practices, by which you will be left open to demonic energies, consume existing conspiracy product, get excited about new. Same message from the 60s to Acid House to the likes of Joe Rogan and now the Truth Movement. Regarding the latter, there are many sp similarly spiritual espousing figures in Ike's wake. Where I'm deeply suspicious of Ike and regard him as an asset of the wider operation, many of his successors seem more like unknowing marks, who may have good, who may have good intentions but are, in my estimation at least, deeply misguided. One major figure in the UK scene has for years organised online group meditations around key numerical dates, such as the 6th of June at 6pm, 7th of June at 7pm, or dates that can form 33, such as the 22nd of November, the 11th of March, etc. By doing so, he claims, people can place their intention upon healing and positivity to balance out the malign intention of the elites, corralling the easily convinced to open themselves up to universal energies Again, what exactly are the nature of these energies? They never seem to adequately explain this quite vital bit of information. And to do this group meditation energy work on occulted Kabbalist dates, for whatever misguided purportedly positive reason, seems both naive and reckless in the extreme. He also conducts his streams in front of a clock that is always set with the hands on 9 and 11. I've never once heard him refer to this, it just sits there in the background its arms unmoving in plain sight. I want to be clear here, I have no reason to doubt this gentleman's sincerity in his work. I do not believe he is willfully working for the engineers. I've read his books and watched some of his streams, and I find value in much of his output. I do, however, regard him as spiritually lost, wholly misguided, and having been duped into taking on the New Age mindset. As I understand, he was once a Christian but turned away from Christ and began viewing Christianity in Ikean terms of some form of 2,000-year-old elite mind control operation. A conclusion he's entitled to draw, but what did he choose to fill his spiritual life with in lieu of his previous Christian practices? The new age of meditation, chakra work, psychedelics and numerology, inviting any number of energies upon himself to whisper sweet demonic nothings into his ear. The great trick of convincing people they don't need Christ is that in doing so, it effectively tears down the spiritual walls protecting them from what St. Paul called the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It seems that some get to the point where they will knowingly invite such energies upon themselves in the literally misguided, misguided by whom exactly, belief that it will render some sort of spiritual growth upon them. How does this differ to what was sold to the boomers? What happened to won't get fooled again? The good news is that Christ is the great redeemer, and in repenting and returning to him, a person can be brought back under his protection. I only hope the likes of Mark Devlin and other similarly misguided people dispense with this reckless new age folly and walk instead back towards the way, the truth and the life. In recent weeks, I've heard other truth movement purveyors advertising e-courses in magic mushroom use and meditation. Again, what possible distinction from the original counterculture is there in this? It's just a remixed motivation to bring people of different generation to the same behaviour and practices. Others in the show's orbit promote the Tartaria PSYOP. Again, I want to be clear here, I don't doubt their sincerity and I'm not suggesting they are being willfully malign, 
but this is the, probably the most wholly anti-European, wretched demor demoralization fodder out there. Detach a people from their roots, have them disbelieve what their ancestors achieved through the merit of the strength of their homogenous communities, faith in Christ and societal self-confidence. They look at the marvels of architecture, town planning and cathedrals and shake their heads in disbelief that their primitive ancestors could achieve such feats. This is a wholly modern and misguided mindset. The self-confidence, talent, intelligence and devotion of our people could achieve wonders, and still could. Our society is shorn of these characteristics. The tech age has acted like stabilizers on a kid's bike. It has created a society of midwits granted some degree of competence via technological props. Our ancestors did not have such crutches. They pulled themselves up by dint of their own intellect, audacity and dedication. People want to claim this is all some sort of false memory syndrome and our apparently backward ancestors were living in a world of ignorance and fear. This is through the looking glass of demoralization. Cut people off from the past, have them believe their people's achievements were all either stolen or appropriated from some lost externalized civilization, the nature of which lies obscured in the fog of cultural amnesia. Have a society imbibe such theories, detach them from their ancestral achievements, and makes them far more malleable and accepting of future engineered dystopias. Again, are the individuals in question actively pursuing these aims? No, I don't believe so. They are seeking novelty and new experiences, just as the boomers were in 67, the punk rockers in 77, then the pilled up throngs in 1987. Funny how there's always a seven involved in these timelines, eh? They make some good content and they seem like a decent enough bunch, but in instances such as this, I believe they have been misguided into doing the bidding of the elites. So by way of conclusion, I would reiterate that the engineers' societal goals do not alter, only the generational terrain that they play them out on. The main goal of the purported big club meetings in 1960 was, to put it simply, destroy Christianity and the traditional family structure, promote esoteric and occultist adjacent lifestyles and prepare the population to accept the disintegration of their traditional nations fit for global rule. If there's any lesson to be learned down any of these so-called conspiracy rabbit holes, it seems to me that not following, following any behavioural patterns laid out by the enemy would be the most prescient. The best way to do this is quite simple. Reject the new age, return to Christ and embrace the traditional.